In this interview, I'm speaking to the all-round talent that is Joshua J. Good afternoon, good evening, Joshua J. Hello there. How's, how's things? Yeah, things are great. Thanks for um, having me on your show. I'm a fan of the ones I've seen, so this should be great. Yeah, no, it's a pleasure. It's always good to have... Um, sort of transatlantic feel to all of this you know like it, it's very easy for me to get sort of tied down to the people i know well in the in the industry in the uk so it's always nice to sort of spread my wings a bit and, and speak to speak to you guys because we're always emulating the americans see the uk is always sort of following we all seem to be following you guys i think so that's interesting and see from my perspective and i think i have a pretty good one on on the scene over there just through andy it's so different. Everything is different there. The way you guys work, the venues you work, the way you're used, and the way magicians carve out their careers couldn't possibly be more different. And I see a lot of UK magicians adopting American things, but I don't see enough Americans adopting, you know, really great things about the UK. Well, that'll be. An, we'll we'll talk about that then because I'll be interested to know what you think is so. You know, what the good? Because it'd be great to be able to take the good parts of. Of what you guys do and the good parts of you know what we do and and see you know see where the match is and see where so we can combine the things but very quickly i know you i'll i always start like this i tell you how i know you and then you tell me where i'm wrong um so i mean i know you mainly really i knew you through reputation because you were this very young boy who when i started you were writing you were writing for magic magazine you i mean you, you put a book out when you were 17, seven, 17 um, and then obviously I know you kind of more now through the session and through Andy, which is something that I really want to talk about as well. Um, but other, other than that, I don't really know, you know, who you are and what you do. So just sort of, just sort of fill in a little bit for those of us over here who kind of know you through the session more than anything. It's always hard to talk about yourself. But well, I mean, imagine you were, I mean, you don't have to sell yourself, you know, be, be brutally honest, you know, <laughs> where, how did you start in all of this anyway? I mean, what's your beginning, what's your sort of journey to where you are now with, just with magic, not with the business, but just with magic? Right. Uh, came into magic when I was a little boy because my dad did some, not professionally, but just as an amateur level and absolutely loved it, took to it immediately I didn't have any kind of teachers or magic shop around, so by necessity, I had to develop my own material. So from a very, very early age, to me, magic wasn't only getting up in front of an audience and performing. It was, what can we do? What effects are possible? How could I do this? What can I build? And um, started as a kid's show magician when I was a kid doing magic for other kids and grew to love Close up and sleight of hand. Was a restaurant magician for several years. For three years, I worked um, three different restaurants, all three in Ohio, where I'm from. Made the move to New York City, uh, which is where I am now. And uh, I work professionally here, and my management is in Los Angeles, so I travel all around doing it. And then I have the whole magician side of things, which is like the only way other magicians know me, but I think that's the only thing they know me for. I mean, I am doing shows. Uh, magicians know me because I lecture, and now I am partners with Andy in uh, Vanishing Ink and releasing products. And uh, I'm an author. I write uh, books on magic, both for magicians and for the public. And, yeah. And so, yeah, and you do do a, an awful lot, don't you? You've got a lot going on. It seems to me that you've got a lot going on. For So, I mean, how old are you now, if you don't mind me asking? You're 31 now, so you, you've you've done a lot in a very short space of time. I have. I mean, I, I'm not. Um, I I I hate to you know brag about myself, but the one thing that I think I can say to my credit uh, that other people have said, and I believe it's true, is I do think I'm one of the hardest workers in magic, and that's not a skill, you know, qualitative judgment. I just I think I put in flat out more hours than just about any other magician and so where does that come from then what i mean is it were you raised to be sort of with a great work ethic was that something or is it just the love of what you do probably uh, a little bit of both i mean 
I'm a hard worker, and it, as you know, as anybody who's probably watching this knows, the great gift we have is that we're doing something that we love. There is nobody in this business that hates magic but just can't turn down the great money of magic. I mean, there, there's so many easier ways to make a living that you have to assume that everybody involved is doing this because they love the lifestyle and the magic. So, I mean, I was working in earnest last night, just to give you an example. Of, I'll, I'll tell you about yesterday, okay? Yesterday I didn't have a show because it's a, it's like, what, yesterday was a Monday, I think? Yeah. But yesterday I woke up, rehearsed my one-man show totally through because I'm taking it to Europe in a month and a half. Then I uh, sat down and wrote my articles for Magic Magazine that I have to do. So I wrote some of those. Then I went and did a donation kind of show for a friend, something called The Innocence Project, where I performed out. Came back very late at night, and as the girlfriend's watching a movie, I'm sitting there editing stuff for Vanishing Ink and running that. And that takes you from about 10 a.m. when I got up to 3 a.m. when I went to bed. It's just a, con I mean, and that's, that day is as unusual and atypical as today was, and tomorrow will be. It's just, it's constantly different, but constant work. So, I mean, with those various skills, I mean, I'm intrigued. I mean, the, real, the thing that really intrigues me about, about yourself and Andy and it's, it's, is, is the writing side of things. Because um, that's, I think, it's one of the hardest, I think it's one of the most underestimated skills that someone can have. Because, I mean, it's, it's really difficult. I find it really hard to do. I mean, I, I struggle with it. I try it, but I find it very difficult to do. Uh, do you have, I mean, are you efficient or are you creative or are you a bit of both do you know what i mean by that are you, do you have a process um i don't have a process every book happens differently every day happens differently but what i am is methodical so i will plan it out i'm a list guy i'm very organized very demanding of the people i work with i can uh i expect a lot but i also give a lot and um i don't know i mean i think that the the bigger question of what you're asking, we can come back to writing, I mean, that specifically is what my degree's in, but because this is sort of a show about the business of magic, here is, in a nutshell, the one thing I can offer. Because I'm not the great, I, I didn't go to business school, I, I went to school to be a writer. But um, if, if I have achieved any success, it's because of this. Uh, I think it's very important to be diversified in magic. I think that 90% of the advice I read about magic and business is wrong. I think it's written by people who shouldn't be writing about magic and business. I think it's, uh, it's almost all wrong. For example, when I got into magic, I was told lots of things that turned out to be so patently wrong. Um, I was told that you should Focus on one thing, and that's it. So if you decide, are you going to be a stage magician or a close-up magician? But you can't do it all. I find that to be wrong. Uh, don't focus on magicians. There's no money in the magic community. That is not true at all. Uh, at least it's not been the way for me. Um, and this all this idea of specializing in one thing and advertising in magic, I've had no success with that. So... Diversification is important, and you know, if this is a show about success in business, you know, my one of my only other hobbies outside of magic is investing. Um, I read about investing, I follow it very carefully, I meet with people about it. Investing is, is very important in making your income work for you, and I say that not as a separate thing of magic, it's very important to my career because that investing side of things is tied to my income in magic and lets me do all the important things that don't make any money, like creating tricks, taking trips to see magicians, doing a one-man show, which is almost impossible to make work financially, but takes a year of your time. And there's all these great lessons embedded in the investing world that apply to magic, such as diversification. You know, everybody talked, everybody told me, you need to be doing corporate magic. Well, guess what? In 2008, everybody that told me to be doing corporate magic, all their work dried up. They had nothing to do, and I had invested in this separate career of touring, doing lectures, and shows, and, and things for magicians, and that didn't dry up. So I was very lucky in that respect. Yeah, I mean, I, I was one of the people who got badly burnt with the whole 
focusing on the corporate market, invested a lot of money in marketing myself to the corporate market right. and really took a hit on it, you know, and whereas all my friends were doing weddings yeah. and, you know, doing those things, which I hadn't, just hadn't considered, were, were all sort of, you know, and still are kind of humming along quite nicely because, uh, so That's you're absolutely perfect. right in that respect. You're absolutely right. And obviously that, you know, what you're doing is working for you. I mean, I'm, you know, I know you live in New York and just looking in the background, you're obviously, you're not living in, in squalor, are you? You know, you're, you're doing all right. It's, it's just working for you. It is. It's working for me and it's the life, um, it's the life I want. I mean, I could definitely apply my skills to a million other ways and probably be making more money. But as I'm sure you can relate to, you know, you just were telling me that you're a father. I mean, how great it is that you can choose your moments and be a father to your kids and be around and I can do the things I want to do and this life allows me to really enjoy things and not clock in a desk job every day at work. It's very yeah. lucky. I mean, I really feel really lucky. And I think you're right. I think, and, and I, you know, we are, as an industry, it's, um, I don't think people realize how lucky we are and in, in, in the sense that we don't work, I think, the majority of magicians don't work hard enough. I think that's but true. But realising, because they don't realise just how lucky we are to be doing what we're doing, you know, they just assume it's, they kind of take it for granted a little bit. Yeah, I, I think that's probably true. And look, I mean, I think it was Andy Warhol who said, uh, business is the greatest kind of art. I mean, all these things are totally connected, you know, even though this isn't a talk about what we love about magic and creativity and magic, it's all interconnected and they all relate to each other. I mean, I think that this idea of diversification, I'm not just saying that because that's been the most financially viable idea. I'm saying that makes it exciting to get up in the morning. I mean, I got a book deal. I'm writing another book for the public for kids that I'm really excited about. And that takes place here in my workshop where I get to cut up boxes and come up with easy tricks for kids. Then I'll have a show. I have a show in a couple of days and two more over the weekend. So I've got all my show stuff over there and I'll get ready for those and go do those and then I have these three girls coming over tonight that are helping with my internet marketing at least that's what they, they said they were going to do <laughs> I don't know. but uh, you know what I mean so it's it's very interesting to me to keep things very different from a sanity point of view from an interest level I mean yeah. look, I, I am always building stuff and working on stuff and writing stuff and, and that's more much more interesting to me than the guy who's got six gigs this week and six gigs next week, and six gigs the week after that, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think this idea that to be constantly creating is, it, it is what, I mean, it's what keeps me sane. And I, you know, I've come very close not to being sane many times, but and it, the idea that you can, if it's not working for you, then in the industry, and we can simply take a sidestep and do something else. We can try a different path. I mean, I think it's a very useful, Sure. A useful way of looking at it. So, I mean, look. Let's look at the, some of the things you have done. Then, I mean, so for, the thing that stands out for me, having seen you do this, was was your lecture that you did. You came to the UK, and this is something I forgot to mention when I when I sort of talked at the beginning. I saw your lecture. You came to the UK. Two thousand eight, two thousand nine. Yeah, it was it was, it was just three four years ago, and. Your lecture was the best lecture I have ever seen, and to this date is the best lecture. And I'm not just saying that because it was the most, it was the most thought through lecture I've I've ever seen. Thank you. And not what was interesting as well is, is it was clearly a very <laughs> profitable lecture. You know, so the fruits of your labour were, were you know were well paid for at the end. You, but it was a so you take. You do take a lot of, you put a lot of effort into the detail in what you do. Well, yeah, I mean, um, you know, that's something, um, boy, I, I do have to be careful what I say here, because I don't want to criticize a whole uh, nation. Of you people. know what, it, 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 you, I think you, I think you're in a position to criticize, it's not criticism, it's, it's constructive criticism is it, is it you know it's because i i'm probably going to agree with you <laughs> because if i think i know where you're going with this so i'll be controversial and, and for the sake of being honest and probably piss off your viewership um thank you i appreciate it lecturing i've always treated like a show david williamson gave me the advice when i started treat it like a show put the work in that you put into a show and most lectures get that wrong most lecturers say I got these six, let's just assume they're good lectures. So let's assume the tricks are worthy of the explanation, which is already 
too big of an assumption. But you got the tricks, but they just think, okay, and then I'll explain them. But I rehearse the explanations as much as I rehearse the performances because there are gags to be had in there. There is a learning curve to teaching. Lecturing is teaching, it's not performing, it's teaching. And some people are great performers and terrible teachers. And you, if that's the case, you have to work on that. And like anything else, flight time, as Penn and Teller call it, doing it, I've done a lot of lecturing. So I appreciate that you noticed that, and I do put a lot of work into it. If you ask Andy, he will tell you that even though Andy's seen my lecture 20 times, every single time afterward, I have very specific questions for him. Did you like this better here or there? Did you like that? Was it too long in this? Was it too long in that? And if I can make an observation, which will get me in trouble, it's that in your country, of which not only am I a huge fan, but I have many friends there, and I think that your country has some of the best working close-up magicians out there. But I, I do see when they come here or when I'm over there and seeing it, I think that a lot of British magicians tend to over-explain their tricks. Um, I saw a very well-known British magician lecture at Blackpool a couple of years ago or something, I forget when. And the material was great, but in his hour, he covered three things. In that same space of time, I do nine, and sometimes if I'm feeling ambitious, I'll do 10 or 11. And I think that the big secret, one of the big secrets for me for lecturing has been even if we have these great ideals that we are not going to show how we do tricks, we're going to show how they can do tricks. That's really not realistic. If you show a trick that's terrific, any pro that's going to put in the time to learn it is going to follow up and ask you questions or take notes or buy whatever it is that he needs to do it and study it. So instead, what a lecture should be is more of a display of your material, why you do it, why you made the choices you made, certain interesting facets of the explanation, a, a Cliff's Notes version, so to speak, and let the people take from it what they want. And um, so I appreciate you saying that, and maybe you picked up on the fact that a lot of people just say, you covered so much more in your lecture than most lectures do. You know? Well, I mean, to be honest with you, I mean, I, the, for me, the whole thing just kind of, it was just, it was, it was pretty seamless, actually. I mean, which was the main thing, because, I mean, I, you know, I do find lectures very clunky at times you know they it is kind of like we've got exhibit a exhibit b exhibit c whereas with yours i did feel i did feel that it was an arc it was a performance and then it and and there was the payoff at the end which was you know it was really interesting to see so uh yeah but and, and what watching that i kind of there was a um, I kind of thought this is here's someone who's going to end up being a, a motivational speaker is going to be sort of because the, the presentation side of it and the, the speaking side of it was extremely strong. I mean, is that something that you're are, are you do you know what I mean? You, you must do some of that. speak. you must do speaking now. I mean, surely I do speaking. I do a, a thing called tragic magic. And again, this is where like all this diversification can lead together. And this is where, you know, I'm such a planner and think about these things. I wrote an article before that actually I did research I just in my spare time I can't tilt this much but I mean I have a huge magic library and I decided to become the, the expert the world expert in this little thing that I was calling tragic magic which is all the magicians assistants and spectators who've been killed during magic tricks such a weird macabre thing but kind of cool at the same time and I wrote all this up in an article that became this nonfiction piece for Jibissier, the Bill Kalush's Conjuring Arts History Journal. And I took that article and all the visuals that I assembled for it and turned that into a talk, which I have given at the, there was a big Houdini exhibition that traveled from New York to Texas to LA to San Francisco to Milwaukee. And everywhere it went, I gave this huge, like, um, interactive show, talk, speech, PowerPoint on magicians killed doing this stuff. And then since then, I've been taking it to other museums and other places unattached to that. And it's become this product, and it's the most expensive thing I offer. I do it for a 1,000 people at a time. And it's been really great, and it's really great how everything worked together, that this little, what could be less commercial than writing an article on magic history, but I've turned it into this product that I perform, and I love to do it, and it's one of the most well-received things I do. And, you know, so this, again, coming back to this diversification, the writing ties into, the performing ties into the 
magic community and the public, and it all goes together. And of course, you've got the one man show now as well. Yeah, yeah. And so, what's the what's been the sort of the 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 history behind that in terms of? I mean, every magician wants to do a one man show. You know, I mean, I've done variations of a one man show, as it were, but never. Never, in my own opinion, never, never, in my opinion, nailed it. You know. Um, well, me neither. But I mean, that's probably part of the part of the perfectionist in us that we always want to improve. I mean, that that was a very uh, selfish, but in a good way, selfish. I mean, that was that was. I sort of said, okay, you've been really plowing and working hard at a lot of parts of your career that sort of feel like making a living. It's time to do what, what do you, if you close your eyes, what do you want to do? And I close my eyes and I want to do a show my way. And I want to use it to talk about things that interest me, people who interest me, parts of my life. And I wrote this show and I took eight months working on this show. And I opened the show in my hometown in Ohio, which is, you know, a smaller place than New York, an easier place to, to break it. And uh, we did 45 performances there over a period of uh, weekends, like Thursday to Sundays for a little longer than a month. And then I took it to Naples, Florida, which is another area that's like just very easy with theater. The theater rentals are, are easy to do and, and it's easier to promote. And I took it down there and gave another 20 performances. Then we took it from Magicians to Magic Live and I did eight performances in a day. And then I've since done like one-offs in New York and Somewhere else I did a one-off and I'm just preparing it again I took about a year off and it's gonna go to uh, Portugal Luis de Matos is bringing me into headline this festival he's running and then he's gonna video it as part of his video series I'm gonna do uh, is this the Coimbra you're going to Coimbra yeah 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 there's a good friend of mine gonna be there actually I, I did, I did I've done it many times for Lewis I've done a lot of stuff with Lewis but oh, cool. okay. there's well, a good friend of mine called Ben Woodward out there who's uh, Oh, nice. A very funny man. Yeah. Oh, great. Well, my show's not funny at all, so I'm sure we'll get along great. So what is what is the um, what is the show? I mean, is it is it biographical, autobiographical? No, it's, it's completely autobiographical. It is a very different magic show, and I'm proud of that. I mean, it is definitely out there. It is definitely different rhythms and themes, and I mean. For, from the ground, from the, the moment you walk into the theater, it is a different kind of magic show than what has been done. And it's not everybody's cup of tea. And some people have a hard time wrapping their head around it. But I think that those people uh, are quite limited in what they view a magic show can be. Yeah. So the thrust of it is it's an autobiographical show. So I talk about three artists that mean something to me. Alfred Hitchcock. A guy, uh, a, an artist who's like a video artist called William Kentridge from South Africa who does video art, and um, another artist who has been in my life. So each of those artists are, are talked about through a trick where I talk about what they do with their work. Like William Kentridge does all sorts of things in reverse. So I do a card trick in reverse and talk about him. And Hitchcock has the MacGuffin and the suspense and the surprise ending, so I do a card trick around that. Um, I talk about women that I've dated and, and tackle the subject of magic for chicks. And so I go on a date with somebody in the audience, and that's how I do my Bill and Lemon. And um, all the places that I've traveled around the world ends up being the finale to the show where I have 12 cards selected, and I find each one with a different trick inspired by a different country around the world. So the music for each card changes, the style of the cards change, and so on. And, and there's a lot of it in there. I talk about an injury that uh, almost lost a hand in, and so I do a trick one-handed and talk about that. There's all this interaction with video. I, ha I talk to characters through a video screen. I'm sort of a, I had to solve the problem. I wanted to have a cast, but I, I didn't want to have a real cast to travel with. So I filmed their part of dialogue on a bench, on a half of a bench. So if you can imagine, there's a huge screen on stage with me, and they come in and sit down on the bench, and half of the bench is real. It comes out of the screen and is a real bench, and I can sit in it. And we're both life-size, and we're both right next to each other. And the dialogue is so perfectly timed that we have these conversations that lead us into the tricks. So these conversations that sort of drive the show are, the, are my attempt to answer all the questions that audiences ask at a magic show. 
So one of them deals with danger and magic and leads up to the dangerous trick and how I broke my hand. One of them talks about is magic art. So I sit there and there's a musician and he's saying, oh man, those tricks aren't art. And I'm saying, oh, but they are. Think of it. When you're a musician, you do this and I do this. Yeah, but not that. And we go back and forth and somebody else talks about creating magic because it's not clear if you go to see a show, if a magician is like a, a singer or a comedian and he's writing his own material or is everybody the same? And so I'm able to answer these questions through that dialogue. And for the show, how much sort of outside direction did you get? You presume you got a, did you get, you got a director in? So um, I'm really good friends with a guy named Ken Weber who wrote this book, Maximum Entertainment. Yeah, I'll yeah, yeah. Be having dinner with him tomorrow night. Um, and he came in for a period of months, once or twice a week, to my apartment. And I had pushed all the furniture aside and set it up as a stage. And, I mean, over eight months, this material just developed and developed and developed. And so he gets a big credit. And he's, you know, his subtitle of his book is Director's Notes for a Magician. And so while I don't know that, that he can be able to claim that he's the absolute director, he certainly helped direct many parts of the show. And as did a guy named Vinny DePonto, who was like my lighting and sound guy the whole time. He really, I'll tell you a huge benefit is I had another very good magician traveling with me all over the country, watching all, whatever it was, 80 some performances of this show. And again, just like I told you earlier, I mean, I'm ruthless with myself. So every night when I drive back to wherever, I would just say, what was worse tonight? What was better tonight? How come I keep fumbling in this part? How come this cue is always late? What can we change? And so it grew so much in those 80 performances because we were thinking critically of, about it the whole time. And so now, do, you, do you now feel you have the finished product or is it still evolving? No, I, it's definitely still evolving, um, but I feel like uh, there's going to be, I'm not going to put any more time into this show. I will probably take the three pieces from it that I really enjoy doing and really like and really resonate. And those fit really well into the next concept that I'm, that I'm on about for a, a one man show. Okay. So. And very quickly, actually, you touched on a, on a thing, um, which was for a while on the internet, this idea is, is magic art. Right. So, I mean, okay, you know, a two-minute version of <laughs> is magic art. What is your t what's your take on that then? I mean, I I always think, and I, I think a lot of guys are getting hip to this as well, and we kind of roll our eyes. I, mean, I think it's a very flawed question. I mean, the truth is, and and you know, I love art as in art museums and so on. So I mean, I think about these things a lot and read up on different kinds of art. Anything can be art. Making yeah, a chair yeah. can be art at the right level. So it's very foolish for somebody to say a blanket statement magic is or isn't art. I mean, that depends if it's a guy working at TGI Fridays doing magic or is it Rene Levon? I mean, you know, they're the same profession, but they're worlds apart. Have you, Plus, all, have you Has your path ever crossed with Seth Godin while you're in New York? Do you know, Seth, have you bumped into him? Not only have I um, bumped into him, but he's, uh, he's become a friend. Uh, I have my own web series that isn't out yet. But he was the first guest on my web series. Oh, I am deeply, deeply jealous. I am just... Man, you, you should have seen him. I spent about two hours with him a month ago interviewing him. And I did what I feel is a really cool trick uh, with him. Was, I, I, all, the idea of the web series is I'm talking almost head to head like this. And then I do a trick tailored to that career. Uh, so in his case, I said, I just after the interview, I said, all right, are you ready? And he had no idea what to expect. Said, you and I are about to create the next great selling product. Through your books and your interviews, you have helped so many entrepreneurs launch. We are going to launch our own product right now. So I want you to think of an object, another totally unrelated object, and a color. And so he thinks, I do this stuff, whatever, and I say, what are you thinking of? And he says, a watch, like a wristwatch, a tie, and the color orange. And then I just say to him, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, there's no wrong answers here. How would you combine all of those things to make something? And he's so smart, he just goes, you know, well, it could be a tie that you wear for fashion and then it's got a clock on it so you can see at a cocktail party what people are wearing. Or maybe it's a watch you wear that looks like a fashionable tie. Or maybe it's a watch with tie patterns and maybe it's a tie with watch patterns and all this stuff. And I say, why don't you choose what it is? So he settles on 
a watch that's made out of a tie with a timepiece on it. And there's a box that's been between us the whole interview sitting right there. And I say, I'd like to shake your hand and congratulate you. Here's the prototype. My lawyers will be in touch. And he holds up a tie with a watch. And it just, it killed him. He's, he was so generous with his reaction. There's no audience, so it could be stilted. And he just went like this. I don't understand. He looked right at the camera and he's like, I know you probably think I was in on this, but he just did this to me and I have no clue. And he was really sweet about it. Yeah, I'm a massive, massive fan. I um, He came over here to launch the Icarus Deception. Oh, cool. And so I did, I did a 142nd presentation at the London opening. Did... The, the Icarus thing so yeah it was great kind of, so I'm deeply jealous now and my see with it, when I started doing these magic state of mind talks my aim was always to move closer and closer to get an interview with Seth Godin so you, but you've, you've you've pipped me there isn't it yeah it was uh, it was tough I had to pull a lot of strings but you know he's a huge magic fan yeah he no and, and he's I know he's written because he, I know he's, he's in his blog he's mentioned Steve Cohen he, he talks about Houdini um, and obviously I mean I suppose being in New York it's a much tighter it's, it's everything sort of inter, interweaves with each other I should imagine so. yeah no he's um, and he's you know he knows about Penguin and how they market their magic to magicians and no he's um, he's really tuned into magic for sure yeah no he's a good guy he's good and I look forward to seeing that um, when's it out when is that coming out then the Whenever my editors can get it finished, um, we filmed four episodes, one with Seth Godin as a marketer, one with a world-famous artist who I know through friends, and she's a fantastic sculptor, and all her sculptures are like, sculptures are like illusions. And uh, Jeff Deskovic is a very famous person here who spent 16 years in prison for rape and murder, crimes he was proven innocent of. So he um, spent 16 years wrongly in prison, so I do a prison trick with him. And a very famous fashion photographer doing tricks with photographs. And so, what again? This is something else. This is kind of almost a sort of a, a completely new thing. I mean, is do, how does this come about? I mean, do you just sit down one day and go, you know what, it'd be a really good idea? I mean, is that how it works for you? Is it? it... Yeah, I mean, this is what I'm saying. I mean, and and again. I struggle, I struggle to put it into words, and I know because Andy shakes his head at me all the time and is like, man, it's a good thing I know you because you come across so egotistical sometimes, but I know you don't mean it that way. Like, I don't mean this in an egotistical way. I really genuinely don't. But the great accomplishment is that you set up your career in a way that you don't have to make day-to-day -day decisions on, on magic for money that I can wake up and I can say, you know what, creatively, I wanna do a web series and I'm gonna rent a theater in New York City and I'm gonna pull every favor and I'm gonna get a eight person crew and I'm gonna work for a month on illusions designed for one person to be done one time and I'm gonna hire Doug McKenzie, Blaine's assistant, to assist me in coming up with these illusions and do it. And there's not even a chance that'll be profitable, but I can justify my time doing that in as much as I can justify a tour or a big corporate show and it all comes from this diversification that allows one thing to allow the other and hang your hands and, and it works together and I feel really lucky to be in that position that yes I just wake up and I plan and I decide I want to do that and my friends are going like God you know but you're never gonna make money from that I don't understand but it it's not it's not a concern about that, you know. Yeah, I, I don't think it's luck at all. I think it's I think it's through, you know, only through hard work and and making the right decisions at the right time that that happens. It's not luck. I think. No, and, it's, it's not luck, and, and and that's that's true. But it it's also that these things it's a long game. You know what I mean? It's developing the kind of career that isn't based on the quick buck, but on the long game. I mean, hopefully, if these turn out as I want them to turn out these interviews will live on for free for a very long time but it helps there's almost always a win-win like the most recent win-win that magicians that your viewers will be familiar with is I spent two years on a book called uh, magic in mind this is a 550 page ebook that is free it has Darren Brown Juan Tamarez with some unpublished English essays it has Robert Houdin it has Rene Levant I got permission from all the greatest living magicians. 
I got permission from Tommy Wonder's estate to include some of the best essays. It is truly between two digital covers, virtual covers, the best book on theory ever assembled. And I was honored to just be the one annotating and assembling it. And I gave it away. And I didn't make a penny from it, and it took a ton of time. But that gift, which I hope leaves magic in a better place than where I found it, I think it'll be a great resource, that gift also got 9,000 downloads in the first month it was on Vanishing Ink. That's over 6,000 brand new names and addresses for our business. It was a measurable increase in our business from this do-good activity. So it's fun how things always tend to work out in fun ways, even when they aren't doing a gig for money or something. Well, I mean, it's a great, I mean, it is the way, it's the way internet marketing works, isn't it? They do, you know, there's the old thing, you know, give away your best material when it feels uncomfortable, give away a bit more, you know, that's what they say. Just keep uh, giving away. Seth Godin calls that permission marketing. Yeah. Um, so you, you don't interrupt somebody while they're doing something to annoy them. You say, hey, if you want to hear about this, come through here or come to me and ask and I'll tell you, you know. So, so coming just because I'm, I'm aware of time here for you. Um, very, we, we, obviously, Vanishing Inc. is in the UK, the, the, the sort of your biggest project here, I would have thought, with, with Andy Gladwin. With, I mean, well, it's not just the UK. I mean, it's, 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 it's an internet business, so it's worldwide. Um, how did that come back? Did you know Andy beforehand? Or were you, or obviously, you knew him a bit beforehand. But... Yeah, Andy and I were on a TV show here in the States when we were both kids, a Lance Burton TV special, and we met and, and fell out of touch for a period of years. And in 2008, I did a 40-city tour of the UK, which you spoke of earlier. And I'm staying with Andy one night, and um, I say to him, you know, we're having one of these these uh, deep guy talks, and I say to him, like, you know, I'm really happy, but I sell my footage to other companies that make money off my ideas. I come up with tricks and give them to other people and watch them make the ideas. <clears throat> And I see people starting it up, and I don't know how to do that, but it looks big. And he says, well, I've got a totally different set of problems. I have a desk job I don't love. It pays me a great wage, but I'm not doing what I love. I want to be a professional magician. I want a way to release my ideas. I have the wherewithal on the Internet side of it, but I don't have the uh, you know, connections in the magic community yet. And it was the perfect partnership. And he is truly the perfect partner. He's the perfect best friend and he's the perfect partner. He's the only guy I've ever met who genuinely works as hard or harder than I do. He's honest to a fault. He wouldn't hurt a fly. He's got great business sense and we have different skills that sort of complement each other. You are a great match in that respect. I mean, um, yeah. you know, when I did the interview with Andy, he, he, that's something he sort of, sort of brought up very early on, was the fact that he's quite happy to be the guy with the internet skills, you know, the coding guy doing all the, all doing that. And, and he's very happy for you to be the, the sort of the front man, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that may be changing too, because he's got a lot to offer and he's performing. And I think he wants to do more of that. And he is taking that role and I'm, you know, happy to help him where I can, but, um, Vanishing Inc is great. And I mean, while we're talking, you know, maybe I assume that if your viewers are watching this show, then they probably know an awful lot about magic and business. So, this may be totally basic for them, but the the goal with Vanishing Ink was two parts. One is artistic and one is business and practical. The artistic part is Andy and I know, we think we know what great magic is and we have great friends in magic and we think we're able to put out great products for great magicians and, and it's fun, right? It's fun to write about Rune Clan's magic because then I get to learn about Rune Clan's magic on a level I wouldn't otherwise. So there's that side of it. But on the practical side, the one thing that every investing book will tell you about, every career book will tell you about, is you need to have a passive income. People who have only active incomes uh, live and die, eat and starve based on the work they're handed. So if, if your only income are the shows you do, then you're going to have feast and famine along with the ebb and flows of the economy, with your personal life, and so on. Vanishing Inc. is a passive income. We do business every day, 24 hours a day, in all the you know, major countries of the world with a focus on Australia, England, France, United States, and Canada. 
and our warehouse is in California. The operation has doubled in size the first three years and now increases in size at a respectable level. And it's so great because it's yet another thing that allows us to not be on the road when we don't want, not take the shows where the, the bar mitzvah DJ is going to be blasting and you can't be heard. And you know, So when you say, why did we start it and what's it about? I mean, it's been a great source of passive income in that sense. And it's, a, and it's a journey you enjoy taking as well, which is kind of clearly something that's very important for you. It's like, I mean, truly, I look for, Andy and I Skype a little meeting every day, and some of the days it's business, 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 and some of the days it's, let me show you that thing I showed you the other day, I've changed it, or have you seen this clip on the internet? I mean, it is the perfect match of like best friends and running a business, and we've never had a fight. I mean, we disagree on things all the time, but we just work so intuitively together that one of us uses the key word, the safe word, you know, like, this is really important to me to do it this way. And I'm like, okay, if it's that important to you, I trust you. I disagree, but let's try it. And he does the same for me. And um, no, it's, uh, I've learned so much from that. That's fantastic. And okay, I, I'm really conscious of your time now. Um, right at the beginning of this, we said there was a difference between the UK and and the uh, the American way of being a professional magician, and obviously I think we've touched on on some of those elements. But if there was something, if there was a key thing that you think that the Americans do better than the British, and the British do better than the American, what would you kind of, obviously you know as succinctly as you as you would like to do it, what do you think the sort of biggest differences are? What can we learn from the Americans, and what could the, the Americans really learn from us? Well, it's tough to say because I'm very much in the scene here and not in the scene there. So everything I, I'm going to comment on in England is just my observations from an outsider looking in. But I know a fair amount of you lot, so I, I think I, I've got a grasp on it. But I mean, what we could learn from you is the wedding market. I think a magic at a wedding is a, such a win-win. And I've been to a couple weddings now in the UK, and it's such a, a, such a great environment to do magic in because everybody's primed in a good mood there's that golden hour where there's nothing else going on which is perfect for magic and weddings are happening all the time so it's this great venue that is totally unacceptable here like the women i've mentioned to uh you know magicians at weddings they're like appalled by it they just it's like saying you want to roast a pig at a wedding it's just not done you know they think it's so crass but um i would love to see an American embrace that and do that in a big way and I think that that's huge a, a difference that I notice I don't know if it's good or bad it's just not our way is um, almost all of the walk around so called engagements that, that a lot of you guys do that I hear about are like at tables like big banquets round tables where you do magic and you might do like a 10 minute set at a table this is so foreign to me I mean in my whole year I might do two or three gigs where I'm working tables like that, like big tables, because I'm almost always brought in before they sit down when they're just standing up and mixing at a bar or something like that. And from what Andy tells me, you guys do a lot less of like holding a drink, holding an appetizer, and then going up to four or five. The thing, just, yeah, they tend to be combined. You tend to do a bit of both if, with these events. Right. So mine is much more in that part. And, you know, I would be scared to death to work an event like you guys work with these big tables and you're doing tricks that none of us do, like bottle through table and chop cup and these big, you know, everybody in your country does Omni deck and these tricks are not done over here, but we have our own things that everybody does. Um, I think that definitely from what I have observed, British UK magicians use their websites more effectively than Americans. I mean, my website's fairly static and out of date, and I probably should be updating it, but I know the busiest magicians in New York, and their websites are clean, nice, functional, but they're not the biggest sources of, of how they're getting shows. It's just not done. I mean, word of mouth is king in my life. I mean, that, every show I do, the old, you know, the old thing where I, if I don't get two shows out of it, then it's been sort of a failure. So... Um, I really don't rely on any kind of yellow pages or phone book or internet marketing or Google AdWords. And I, I know some magicians who do, but to be honest with you, they're not the guys that are 
getting but so many gigs. Do you think that's uh, over the United States completely, or is it mainly New York? Because New York's a different creature, isn't it? I mean, New York's very much a networking... You know, it's like I said when I mentioned Seth Godin. I, I knew you would know him. I knew the, I knew there would be a path that had crossed, you know, through Steve Cohen or through... You know, I knew there would be a, a degree of separation. Um, you know what? That's a good point. I can't say because I don't live elsewhere. I only live here. And I know that I'm very fortunate that when I moved from Ohio, I literally, without exaggeration, was able to double my prices. And, when, and I can say this in total fairness, I am far from the most expensive magician in New York. I would say I'm past the mid-level of what guys are charging, which is a good place to be because I don't think I scare people away with my pricing, but I also think that I'm not such an investment that people you know, think of it as prohibitive. But I would say, and maybe again, this is just New York, um, from what I hear about UK prices to New York prices without talking numbers, uh, the, the show prices are much lower in the UK than in New York, which I, you know, I feel bad about because um, I think magicians there have to work so much harder than, than the ones. I mean, I think possibly here it's much more of a commodity in that respect. And I, as I say, I think I said to you at the beginning, there's a race to the bottom here at the moment. Yeah, yeah, you said it a lot. And see, that's not true here. I mean, the energy and the vibe that I get from the magicians I speak with in New York is we're all busy enough that, that we're sharing, you know, contacts and we're covering things for each other and nobody is, uh, nobody is so, so um, out of gigs that they're, they're batting their head against the wall, at least not in the circles I talk to, you know. I think there's more demand than there is supply. Yeah, I mean, I think possibly that there's, um, that maybe in the States you treat it to a degree more professionally because there's, I think we've got an awful lot of amateurs who work professionally in the UK, and that's probably not the case in the States. You know, we probably have a large portion of amateurs who are professionals, and I mean that in the the, the nicest possible way. <laughs> no, I think you're probably right. I think you're probably right, and because of that, and you know, the other thing is your television is totally saturated with magic. I am blown away by how much magic there is on TV, whereas magic on TV here is still so rare and so special that it's quite an event. And having a magician at a party is quite an event. Last week I did a, a poker charity tournament and I've been doing a lot of these things. And like, it's so interesting to me that as I become kind of New York's guy for, for the public, um, for charity tournaments for poker, because that's a big way of raising money here, that they're always like so shocked that, oh, magic at a poker tournament. like. I see 60 decks of cards on a green felt table. I was born for this. This is easy. This is the best place to do magic. And yet it never, ever occurred to anyone. Whereas in your country, I think, if I'm guessing, a lot of weddings have magicians. A lot of big banquets have several magicians doing magic. And uh, I mean, and in this country, you do a corporate event and you can guarantee that someone will say to you, oh, we had a magician at our event last week. And, you know, there's always that back referencing to someone they've seen. It's, I mean, it is a pretty saturated market here. I mean, you know, and, and that, I don't think I'd be very happy with that situation. I mean, there's this guy, I'll tell you a quick story. There's this guy in, in uh, New York, and it came to me through referral for a very well-known uh, L.A.-based magician who this guy was flying in because he saw this guy on TV. And um, on a weekend that this guy couldn't fly in, he called me up and said, do you want to do the gig of a lifetime? The pay is great. You go to his huge mansion. He's younger than you are. He lives in this huge, ridiculous house with a theater and koi pond and fish and swimming pools and all this stuff. And he basically, he's a, he's a very religious Jew, and you do magic at his Shabbat dinner, and he'll have musicians. He had the roots at his house at one point. So I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it for like a month because I was booked every weekend they were going to do it so other magicians in the city had it and this guy loves magic so much that by the time I got there I think five or six other magicians including David Blaine had done this gig it was one of the most unspecial shows for me because these guys saw magic every Friday like clockwork they saw everybody's best stuff they saw ones to hundreds they saw the fruit from the under the cup they saw the the bottle and the coin in the bottle. I mean, you can just go through all the classics, and I'm thinking like, oh, that was that guy, that was that guy, that's this guy. 
You know, Blaine got in his swimming pool and held his breath for 10 minutes. How do you top that, you know? So, to be honest, they've called me back and wanted me to come back and do shows. And I, like, try and think of excuses to not go because <laughs> I just, it's so unfulfilling for me to be one of the guys. And, I mean, I, I think I do a nice job for them, but it's just not special, you know? Yeah, and I think, so. I mean, possibly that's, you know, is... is ref- is not the case in the UK so much. I think it is more of a commodity. But I think that's something that possibly we can learn from the Americans, in the sense that I think it's the I think it's us, the magicians, that are in danger of treating it like a commodity. Yeah. And so you know that's that's the you know the impression we give people, and therefore they're going to run with that. You know, yeah. but who knows? Who knows? Um, anyway, look, Josh, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, and. Um, I have no doubt that you're, you know, will go from strength to strength, and because you are one, of, you know, clearly one of the hardest working, one of the, the smartest, brightest lights that I think magic has at the moment. And I, no, no, I mean it. And I, it's always, it's always a pleasure to speak to someone who has, who does what they do with huge enthusiasm. And um, well, so, listen, thank you for that. You know. Well, and thank you, and thanks everybody for watching. Look, I mean, I, I'm very thin-skinned and self-conscious. I mean, I, I'm sure 10 people are going to watch this and say that I came across really egotistical, and I don't mean it at all. I don't, I don't claim to be an expert, and in fact, I spend a lot of my time listening and trying to learn about what makes for great business and magic and great magic in general, and I, I don't have all the answers. I, I say all this, and I share it with you just in the spirit of, like, where I'm at at the moment and trying to learn thus far. It's definitely not any kind of definitive. You, you certainly don't have to justify what you've said. I mean, and you know, anyone who does think that should probably take a leaf out of your book and listen and learn rather than judging, which is usually the first thing on some people's list anyway, isn't it? So uh, uh, to hell with them, you know. <laughs> Let's just uh, do what you do and keep doing it, Josh, because it's fantastic. And I you know, really do appreciate your time. Thanks. Thanks so much. And hopefully our paths will cross. And if you see Seth, say hello. I'm the guy with the bottle in the balloon. Right. Um, <laughs> I'm sure he loved it. He loved it, I think. All right, then. Take care, Josh. Thanks for speaking to me. So a huge thanks to Josh for talking to me. And if you have enjoyed this interview, please leave your comments. And remember, you can see more at www.magicstateofmind.com.